Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to introduce Michael Neymark. Uh, so Michael Neymark, as an uh, alum of MIT and who had a strong presence at the Media Lab, uh, has defined a fantastic space in the pre-VR, pre-VR, and the future of VR and AR as they relate to space, placemaking, and identity. Uh, his work has been tremendously influential in how we understand environments and environmental body tracking and projection, projection mapping for immersive experiences and the future potential of these languages. So without further ado, I'm excited to welcome Michael. Uh, if you're ready, we will uh, unmute you and we can start. Go ahead. Um, hi, firstly, can you hear me? Uh, yep, we can. Okay. Uh, Daniel, I'm, uh, I know we went through it already, having trouble getting the presenter screen. Let me spend just a second. Okay. Um, are you still seeing the full screen? Yes, it looks great from our end. Okay, we're good. Okay, welcome everyone. I think we're good to go. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm calling this talk the defining quality of the metaverse's presence. And that's not me and that's not my opinion. Uh, it's actually a quote um, from Mark Zuckerberg um, in November, 2021, around the time that he changed the name of Facebook. Um, so uh, it's really, presence that I want to spend uh, my time on here uh, and showing you some explorations. Uh, it would not, it would be remiss not to address uh, the elephant in the room, since this is everywhere. And just a few very quick comments about AI generated, particularly images. Um, the first is the difference between credible and accurate. And um, it's pretty clear that AI generated images can be credible, uh, but if you're dealing with the real world, there's an issue of whether or not there's an importance in, uh, in accuracy as well. And uh, the bottom line and the theme for all of this is the need to explore. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to go very quickly uh, uh, through a lot of stuff. Please interrupt. Uh, and uh, at the same time, at the end of each of these sections, uh, we'll take just a, a quick pause. And I am uh, pretty certain we can get this in in under 45 minutes. Okay. So making stuff early. Um, this is an ancient uh, film-based installation uh, going way back, uh, 16 millimeter film. And uh, the idea is to set up a living room uh, with performers and film it from the center with a uh, 16 millimeter camera on a slowly rotating uh, uh, tripod. Uh, and then replace the uh, camera with a projector, loop projector, and uh, uh, spray paint everything white except, of course, the people. Uh, what this means is that the uh, uh, stuff looks really real and the people look really distorted, hence it's called displacements. Note the guitar. Uh, this is an, a later piece done in uh, uh, video. And um, the funny thing is that film cameras and projectors are more symmetrical than uh, digital cameras and projectors. So, so this was actually a harder thing to uh, uh, register and set up. Note the guitar. This is a few years later. I don't know them. They gave me credit. And uh, note the guitar. So the interesting thing to me about stuff like this is that it's better than mine. They did, I think, a really wonderful job. And as we know, projection mapping is a big deal today. And in the Wikipedia entry, uh, it lists Disney as number one for projection mapping, followed by George Harrison, 
followed by um, uh, the Displacements Project, uh, then uh, Stephen Sondheim and uh, uh, the seminal work of uh, Ramesh uh, Raskar coming out of UNC at the time. Okay, here's a more recent project. This was uh, from two or three years ago at NYU Shanghai, where I'd been uh, teaching VR and AR. Um, we called it a Sunday afternoon project, and the idea was to have six students humming a 47-piece orchestral version of Beethoven's Ode to Joy based on the layout of an archetypal symphony hall. This is Dublin. And note the heights of the performers and the conductors. And the trick was to shoot everybody carefully at the right heights and distances uh, so that they could fit together with a stereo panoramic camera uh, and very little special effects processing. So this is a 180 degree stereoscopic immersive experience. You can find it on uh, YouTube. So shortly after making it, we exhibited it um, publicly with a three-screen 3D uh, 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 triptych of um, uh, consumer televisions. And a few months later, you know, around Shanghai, there are these advertising kiosks everywhere. Uh, this is in the uh, uh, lobby uh, of my apartment building. Um, it's an ad for cosmetic micro uh, surgery. And uh, this is in the lobby of my doctor's office. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's a coincidence. Um, uh, our grads go off and work at local media companies and uh, uh, who knows. Okay, so here's a project I think you all know about. This is uh, uh, Aspen, Colorado, 1978 and the blob of brown hair uh, passing down uh, some paper is me as a student. It's the MIT project called the Aspen Movie Map. Uh, we use stop frame film cameras and the bicycle wheel in the back to uh, trigger them. And uh, the imagery is not streaming video. It's not still photos. It's not computer graphics. It's a different animal. It's distance triggered cinema, you could call it. And unlike uh, Street View today, the main, the main goal was presence that really uh, like being there. And uh, Andy uh, Lipman was a PI, a principal investigator. And I think is the one that came up with the term uh, surrogate travel. Uh, so more than anybody else, I think I kept doing projects like this for a bunch of years. This is an electric cart with another stop frame camera uh, triggered by an encoder on the axle uh, for the Paris Metro 1986. Uh, yes, that's a mime. Uh, we hired her to add visual continuity and apologies for the bad transcoding from CCAM. So this was a public kiosk to help people find their way around. Uh, here's a project for the Exploratorium in 1987. Uh, that's a large, expensive gyro-stabilized motion picture camera on the helicopter. And by the way, the replacement for this today is something that can fit in the palm of your hand. It's pretty cool. All the way around the world. All around the world so uh, that's a trackball. And the idea was not to simulate a Superman, Superwoman perspective as much as to give you this hyper real, otherwise impossible experience to have on your own without media. Uh, here's a project for the ZKM, Center for Arts and Media in Karlsruhe in 1991. Uh, we worked with the tram company and uh, interfaced the camera with the odometer. Uh, it was a chance to use uh, an orthoscopically correct projection so the field of view was correct. It was life-size. 
Uh, it did feel like a giant window. The um, uh, rails ensured unrivaled, unrivaled stability. That was good. It made it look almost CGI. So several years later, uh, they give me too much credit here. They reshot everything and um, then uh, ended up with a perfectly registered then and now uh, uh, installation, which was really quite cool. But it was life-size, but 2D. So here at the Banff Center in 1993 was an opportunity to do a stereoscopic wide angle uh, version. And for a bunch of reasons, we packaged it in a turn of the last century uh, kinetoscope-like thing with a crank to go through uh, roots uh, and an eye hood, which gave not only left-right stereo, but proper orthoscopically correct scale. And even though your head was facing down, turning the crank actually felt tight linked and it felt a lot like being there, uh, even with its uh, janky frame rate. So partly by design at uh, Paul Allen's Interval Research Corporation, uh, this fueled some very, very early uh, research in volumetric video. Uh, we were working with uh, uh, gurus Harlan Baker and John Woodfill, and the uh, P. de Bevec and L. Villarreal are Paul de Bevec uh, and Leo Villarreal, who went off to do some uh, really wonderful, oops, interesting work. That's Paul with his light stage, and Leo is the artist behind the San Francisco B Lights project. So making stuff early typically is not commercially motivated. It's relatively cheap and unpolished. Someone will do better versions. Uh, Red Burns uh, called it under the radar. Uh, unsupervised research, Benjamin Bratton, and exploration over exploitation, child psychology. It's Alison Gopnik, and uh, uh, hopefully inspiring uh, for students and interns. Uh, questions so far? Part one? Okay, let's keep going. So this is a chance for me to rant. Uh, it'll be quick, but you'll get the idea. And I'm targeting VR more than the metaverse, but it's pretty scalable. And I want to talk about uh, three elements. One is uh, delirium. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness from Allen Ginsberg's uh, poem Howell. In the case of VR, many of us saw this twice uh, because VR's first wave was in 1990. Um, and things were pretty crazy then, but not in the scale that they are now. Uh, it seems that when you take two um, critically loaded words like virtual and reality and you put them together, it does make people a little bit crazy, you know, like... The Ring and the Hobbit, mine, or life from Frankenstein stories. Um, uh, so far, VR and AR have not met market predictions. Uh, market predictions um, uh, has uh, been nonsense formats like the forums like VR in 100 years, vacuum chamber sensibility, tech bro scandals, and uh, a lot of the weirdness uh, about the current state of Silicon Valley has had an effect. Uh, let's talk about naivete for a moment. Um, when VR uh, uh, started getting popular after the Facebook acquisition, um, one of the big companies uh, had an accelerator, uh, and this is from the application, and the guy running it is a buddy, and I tamed him and I said, I love you, but it's a little pathetic, and a couple of days later, this turned into this, and you know, it's better, it's still a little naive, some might say a little clueless, but better. Um, so beginner's mind uh, is a popular phrase uh, in our worlds and certainly around Silicon Valley and new media. And uh, the phrase uh, comes from uh, Buddhism and was popularized by the guy that started uh, the San Francisco Zen Center with um, uh, his flagship book called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. But around 2009, the San Francisco Zen Center was aware of how much people in Silicon Valley were using beginner's mind and often as an excuse not to do their homework to the extent that, and this is the San Francisco Zen Center, uh, started a series of talks uh, 
called Expert's Mind, where they very kind of delicately and, and diplomatically uh, connected uh, the two, because we love beginner's mind, but there's no excuse not to do your homework first. Um, and then finally, hype. I assume most of you are familiar with the uh, Gartner hype cycle, which comes out every year. And what I want to point out here uh, is that the shape of this curve um, it doesn't change. It's treated like a law of physics. And, you know, the poor fools in 2021 non NFTs about to uh, fall down the trough of disillusionment. Um, I'll call this out. It's not a law of physics. I believe it's bullshit. Um, it encourages hype. It encourages overshoot. Um, and, uh, you know, if your home thermostat works like this, what would you call it? Broken. Uh, this coupled with um, a uh, kind of unicorn sensibility, this was a real quote from uh, a VC uh, over a USC project uh, that we showed a demo and he said, it's a solid 4X ID and we know what he was talking about. And then he said, we don't, we don't do 4X, we want 40X. And this coupled with um, this, this kind of shape uh, is asking for a lot of trouble. And I'm told that Silicon Valley never used to be quite like this before in big tech. The funny thing is that last year, note the shape. Now, I don't know if that's a coincidence, uh, but maybe they're kind of thinking it should be a little flatter. Okay. Uh, questions so far about the dark side? Michael, you, uh, sorry. Yes. Were you talking and now we can't hear you? Sorry, you have to talk through me. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? I was just yep. curious to see that Gartner cycle again from 2022 to see where VR was on it, if at all, because I, I didn't have a chance to see. Um. Yeah, that's actually interesting. Oh, these, these are these are. Yeah, these these are worth looking at. Um, so, okay, let's take a moment and okay, I go back to 2017. Um, Metaverse isn't even on this one, right? But right, VR, okay, VR. oops. VR is, uh, VR is mixed reality. Okay. Yeah, MR is plummeting, right? Uh, 2019. Uh, I mean, this is obviously a good exercise, but I, I object to the... Uh, physics like nature of the shape of the curve uh yeah i think um vr uh went off look at that well it transforms right so there's like digital twin stuff in 2020 that was big and the metaverse stuff in 2021 uh but it's not yeah that's how you can still keep climbing the curve and keep redefining yeah okay you know here's well, metaverse i think that's part 2022 of 2022 is its first uh, mention. And, um, you know, again, we can't overemphasize uh, Zuckerberg's quote, which was in late 2021, and the name change. Okay, so uh, anything else? Keep going. Okay, let's talk quickly about mediated presence. Um, it's where I've spent a lot of my time, uh, and I have a, a, a pretty simple approach, uh, and it's a mixing board analogy, uh, that um, if we knew what all the sliders are for any element of sensory or effectory uh, interaction with a system, um, and most experts generally agree that we do know what all the sliders are, and if we can turn all the sliders up to 10, which I believe all experts agree is currently not possible, if ever, then by definition, the representation would be indistinguishable from the subject. And we can look at both our sensors and our effectors. And so then the question is, what does it take to trick our sensors and effectors into believing a representation is real? And my little approach, goes like this. Start by asking, what does it take to fool one eye and one ear um, looking through a peephole at a rectangular display? And 
I've asked students a lot, like if the display showed an apple under the circumstances and you went to Best Buy and bought an 8K, you know, whatever display, would most folks be convinced or couldn't tell whether it was an actual or uh, image of an apple? Um, most people say, yeah, we can probably do that right now under these constraints. Person, probably not. Um, it's important to point out that as trivial as this looks, this is where most of the uh, conventional non-AR, VR, audiovisual industry spends its, in, uh, its energy, pixel counts, frame rates, dynamic range, photorealism, and so on. Uh, oops. Did I? Okay. Um, it's a little bit harder uh, to fool two eyes and two ears, but there's a long and lively history of stereoscopy and stereophony. Um, and it's quite a bit harder to allow free head movement. Uh, and, uh, uh, and particularly if the imagery is real world rather than uh, uh, CGI, uh, both moving your head and looking at it in an unframed way is uh, uh, not entirely simple. But now we should understand what the elements are uh, to uh, see and hear all, all around. It's even more challenging to add non-audiovisual senses. Uh, and there's been, as you know, a lot of work in smell, taste, and even mind uh, input. Uh, but most of the activity is uh, haptic. Uh, so now we can see, hear, feel maybe more, but it's all passive. You're a ghost. Uh, so the next piece of this uh, uh, progression is adding input and interactivity. Uh, you know, hand controls, gestures, head position, gaze, and so on, feet and body, voice, maybe mind. Um, so now you can see, hear, touch, and interact, but it could be dead media. Uh, uh, it could be you simply uh, one person in a game. So the final uh, biggest challenge is putting it all together and adding social and uh, liveness. And that kind of takes us up to what's going on at places like Meta these days. So this is um, my approach. Uh, and again, I believe if you don't understand mediated presence, you can't understand the metaverse. Uh, this is published, a uh, six-part series on Medium. It's translated into Chinese by NYU. Um, and it's coming soon as a video mini course uh, launching China-wide this spring. Um, and a little bit about it on mediatedpresence.com. Okay. Questions? Going at a good clip? Okay, let's talk about live. And I'd like to begin uh, something I hadn't kind of dealt with in a long time, a 2009 project coming out of Ars Electronica in Linz, Austria, um, the year that Linz was uh, uh, EU culture capital. And uh, Ars uh, hired me to direct their project for it called 80 Plus One, A Journey Around the World. And one of the things that we did back then was an open call for live bits, art exploring real-time connectedness, where uh, we made it clear that live video is kind of the least interesting things. We were looking for more creative stuff, and we got almost 300 entries from 42 countries. And just to show you some examples, this is called Blowing Air from Beijing to Linz by the Art Collective uh, 8GG in China. And you'll notice, and there's, we built a little pavilion in the half plots of uh, Linz to house these things for the summer for the 81 days. Um, so you would see uh, members of the collective live in Beijing on a display, and uh, they would be taunting you. They could see you, and they would hold up a plate of Kung Pao chicken and say, wouldn't you love some of this? And they'd blow on it. And that hole below the display, uh, the Kung Pao chicken smell would boom, come wafting out of it. Um, they spent a lot of time making these soap bar-like things of uh, smell. 
and uh, uh, installing them. This was around the time that smile detection was becoming widespread on um, consumer cameras. So uh, Pierre Prosk did a project between Linz and Bhutan uh, uh, of people smiling. Uh, Digity by Miriam Schmidt in Germany. It's a box that you stick your hand in and someone in Germany sticks their hand in. And it's nothing more than seeing both hands silently. And it's really quite... Um, uh, uh, tangible media-like in a funny way, uh, even though you can't feel anything. Project out of ITP, uh, Link Cube, Green Screen, and uh, a couple little kiosks and other projects include vibration platform triggered by real-time traffic at the entrance of the Gotard Tunnel in Switzerland, live audio from a town square in Gaza, microblogging from industrial workers in Petesky, Romania. And this is a project, and I'd like you to look carefully at this image. Um, this was done by uh, uh, Melissa Toure, who comes from a village uh, outside Bamako in Mali and had an engineering degree. And the project was to instrument the one pump in this village. Uh, her uncle, uh, she said, runs the cyber cafe. And um, connected to the uh, little restroom that we had in the pavilion, that if not enough water was pumped since the last person used the restroom, you would have to put coins in a coin slot that we installed uh, for the water. So it was monitoring the uh, uh, water pump in real time. Um, is there something odd about this image? Somebody shout out, take a look. Anything? Hmm? Lack of shadow. Uh, yeah. Right? yeah, it's fake. It's a fake image, and it, the whole thing was fake. It was done by a German artist and prankster, Nicholas Roy, and we were easy targets for this one. I mean, it pushed all the right buttons, but we brought him out to give a talk and kept it up, and uh, that coin slot ended up raising almost 1,500 uh, euros, which Ars Electronica then did give to a real water project in Congo. Um, Here's a more recent project called Telewindow from uh, NYU Shanghai. The idea was to take a desktop display, this was a pitch, and um, surrounded by, uh, surrounded with depth cameras, lights, uh, mics, and speakers, uh, and some magic stuff over the screen surface to make it 3D and build two of them, hook them up together and see how close we could come to. Uh, an unmediated one-on-one -on -one, uh, tele-event, uh, teleconference. Uh, we promised our funder that we would fail, uh, that um, Microsoft and Cisco had spent hundreds of millions of dollars, and this is before COVID, by the way, uh, trying to do stuff like this, but it would be a good time to kind of explore the space in an a entrepreneurial way. Uh, and obviously, one of the issues we were dealing with was case correction. There's a lot of work on this. Another one is uh, uh, we were hellbent on uh, being against this, that the face and head were simply too complicated uh, to uh, get an accurate, credible, yes, accurate, no, uh, image of a person. For example, this is, was mine done from the same program, and uh, they're all different. So in uh, 2018, uh, we were working mostly during the summer. We, we had a one camera system up and working and a, a lenticular auto stereo eye tracked uh, package. So this was auto stereoscopic and uh, multiscopic as you moved back to back summer. The next summer we uh, had all four cameras working. Then summer 2020 happened and we were in Shanghai and COVID hit a couple, a few hundred miles away. Uh, and uh, we, we decided that uh, we learned the space pretty well uh, to actually do something practical. And we focused on college students where we could assume that uh, uh, virtually all college students 
remotely had access to one laptop and a smartphone. So we spent the summer uh, seeing what we could do that would be uh, useful to college students. And what we came up with surprised us a great deal. Um, it was an idea that we initially rejected. It was to basically um, mount your smartphone directly above your laptop and particularly the laptop camera and dedicate it to presenter view. And um, we think that one of the reasons it works so well is that different parts of your brain are occupied when you're looking at a coursework PowerPoint uh, than looking at a person. Uh, so we did it. We got into the uh, 3D printed bracket business um, and got a little bit of funding around NYU Shanghai to make several hundred of them and freely distributed and posted on Medium, where it received over 35,000 views and other uh, places started making it. And uh, the narrative that artsy, cool driven exploration could pivot into practical needs driven uh, solutions is a narrative that uh, needs to be encouraged. Uh, we finally published it last summer at ICEA. Um, uh, we learned, you know, near the tail end of our project that Google was doing something uh, on steroids uh, like us. This is their system. This is our system. Uh, interesting space. Okay. Questions about live telepresence in the metaverse. Okay, I'll keep going. And again, we'll, we, we'll have time at the end. So uh, this was a few years ago, uh, uh, something that the New York Times did. So my VRAR students loved it. They thought it was really cool, and uh, but thought it would be cooler if it could be done um, in VR and uh, be made interactive. Um, so we used a VR stereo uh, panoramic camera and uh, uh, the, the campus building and framed it uh, like the other movie maps in a funny way as routes and destinations and uh, Every time you came to a destination like the New York Times project, uh, it would snap into live action, but you would have some graphical signal uh, for uh, choose where to go to next. And we just filmed everything. And again, this is a 360 stereoscopic uh, uh, experience viewable in headsets. Two options, choose one, go. Um, so a project a little bit earlier uh, called Viewfinder uh, comes out of uh, USC that I directed, or cheer-led at least. Uh, and the idea, which at the time we called how to seamlessly flickerize Google Earth, was to uh, develop a means by which your photos could be posed, spatially situated inside a uh, Earth model like Google Earth, um, and it was very important uh, for us that they were your photos. They weren't neutral photos. This was around the time that Microsoft and E. Washington was working on Photosynth and the more neutral, uh, this is way pre-NERF uh, for those of you that keep up with such things. Uh, uh, but, but people are artifacts and we wanted people to be the central reason why you would might want to spatialize your images and then use Google Earth to fly around. And you know, you can see that when you get it right, it's magic. And there's something more 3D and visceral about this uh, compared to push pinning photos on a 2D map. 
And of course, you could do historical uh, images as well. Okay, so also remote travel that's on my radar, uh, and I'm not going to show you in the interest of time. It's easy to find Somewhere Street, a popular NHK series for years now. Um, uh, the deal is they walk around with a steady cam, and it's a little bit like Borat in that it's semi staged and first person and human height. Uh, and where they walk through, you know, towns and villages and go, oh, look, a market, let's go in and then engage with people. Uh, something else for remote travel that's on my radar is have any of you uh, uh, looked at video walks on YouTube? Uh, the deal is somebody takes a camera and it's often on a stick and it's 4K and walks. And um, Paris, there's one that has 5.8 million views. There's something kind of mesmerizing about this. Totally non-interactive, by the way, but kind of cool. I want to squeeze in this project from also quite a long time ago. Uh, the idea was to go to um, several UNESCO World Heritage Endangered Sites, find one spot in each, plop down the equipment and um, film several times a day with the slowly rotating stereoscopic wide-angle pair of cameras, um, make a display out of it, and uh, ideally, we wanted to rotate the screen, but we couldn't, so we rotated the people on a 16-foot diameter rotating floor. This is with the curtain down. Uh, there's usually a black curtain around. But believe me, when you're in a space like this, looking at a 3D image, within seconds, bar none, everybody believes that uh, it's rotating around you. And it's uh, exactly like the feeling that you've all had on a train sitting in the station when the train next to you pulls out and you could swear for a moment that you're moving but you're not it's that visceral feeling um of being remotely that was part of the intention here actual traveling tourism represent 10 percent of the global workforce um, uh, a longtime colleague of mine, Bill Durham, who's a Stanford professor, now emeritus, uh, longtime chair of the anthropology department and uh, running stuff with ecotourism in Galapagos. Uh, uh, when I showed him VR for the first time, uh, he said, wow, this is a win, 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 win proposition and went on to say, it's good for people unwilling and unable to go, better immersion. Uh, uh, though never as good as a real thing. Um, I'm very kind of adamant about the difference between just like being there and the next best thing to being there. The next, the former almost killed VR. Uh, the latter is more realistic, but for people willing and able to go more authentic, less complicated, less Starbucks, good for the place by revenue sharing and good for the planet by uh, less carbon burned. Okay, we're not quite done, but we're going to move into something completely different. But are there any questions about remote travel? Okay, we're going to switch gears. Do come to, yeah, I'm sorry. sorry, Michael, we have a question. Yeah. Sorry, because of the laptop. Uh, yes, hello. Um, Hi. I have a question about a remote teletravel. I'm um, I'm a big fan of uh, having um, uh, playing music, uh, providing music while being in other places because it uh, it, it brings the feeling of uh, this immersive feeling of being in another place and it uh, really reflects on uh, the musical ideas that I perform. Uh, so that's something that I've used with uh, remote teletravel. Uh, also, Professor Todd McOver did. Uh, inspired also by him I did that because he uh, created different co symphonies and compositions in various cities around the world so just wanted right. to make that a small comment um right and I'm so glad you brought that up and uh I've been following Todd's work as a friend and colleague forever so yes thank you so much but I'm super glad you brought that up um that was an unpaid question because this last thing that I'm going to show you um, is about a project uh, called the Global Jukebox. And um, 
This is from November 2022. And I'd like to end uh, with this project as a uh, provocation um, and with its connection to the real world, its epic scale and its slow time. Uh, the Global Jukebox uh, uh, currently has almost 6,000 traditional songs representing over 1,000 societies. Uh, but how slow is this project? The story begins in the 1860s in central Texas where one John, John Lomax uh, grew up. Uh, his parents moved there when he was like four or something. And it's cowboy country, like real cowboys, cows, uh, that would follow the river valley near uh, their home. And John heard their songs and grew up to become a folklorist. And by the 1920s, made some of the world's first field recordings with his teenage son, Alan, assisting. And we know this to be pretty true because the first recorder that they used for this uh, was given to them by Thomas Edison's widow and they made it portable and it weighed 500 pounds. Um, the recordings became the basis for the US Library of Congress Folk Song Archive. Um, here's Alan Lomax and uh, the gentleman behind him with the pipe is uh, Jerry Wiesner, Jerome Wiesner. Uh, who worked then there at the time. By uh, the 1960s, uh, Lomax had amassed the world's largest collection of song and later dance. Uh, uh, people were sending him stuff from around the world, so it wasn't only his. And working at Columbia at the time, they were convinced that they heard patterns and uh, came up with 37 patterns that best represent world music. It includes things like glottal stops and rasps. And, you know, this is so different from machine learning. Uh, this is not a black box. They, they, you know, this is not Pandora or Spotify. They know exactly what's inside. And at the time they had to hand code everything. These are two, uh, three songs uh, uh, that are statistically similar. Um, and bigger correlations, because at the time there were similar databases about everyday life done by people like George P. Murdoch. Um, and they could correlate between everyday life like um, uh, cultures that have um, uh, strong lateral knee movement in their dance styles correlate to cultures that were early adopters of potter wheels and uh, uh, the cultures, uh, music of Central Africa is similar to the music of Georgia and Russia. Inuit music is similar to Patagonia. And uh, Alan really believed that he came up with a unifying theory of culture. Database here. These are excerpts of films from ethnographic filmmakers and travel. This is 1992. From all kinds of archives in Germany and Bulgaria. And and this is what we have coded. What you might call a li mini library of Congress. We have every, almost all the important types of American folk music covered here. Do you know how many hours are here? Uh, well, about 5,000 tapes. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be possible without these new techniques because we wouldn't know. Uh, we wouldn't be able to find the, find the woods for the trees. But now it's, it's as clear as a bell to me in the whole story. So I can now give that back. So um, Alan uh, sent a cold letter in, uh, okay, uh, a few years before this, like to Apple Computer, dear Apple Computer, and it trickled down to me. I was at the Apple Multimedia Lab at the time and visited him and got him some Apple funding and later some uh, funding from Interval Research. Uh, this is a very 1990s looking demo video that he finally let us do, um, very hypercard and laser disc. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, he died in 2002, and in 2011, a book came out on him, and he really was um, the man who inspired a generation of musicians. He popularized the blues, especially through the BBC in the 1950s. Uh, where his songs inspired Lennon and McCartney and Peter Townsend and Eric Clapton and the Rolling Stones named their band after a blues song they heard on 
um, Alan's radio show. Um, this is 2017, a New York Times story. Uh, the project was taken over by his daughter, Anna Lomax Wood, third generation ethnomusicologist. Um, and I'm still advising on the project, but that's the, pro the pro provocation here is uh, with its connection to the real world, its epic scale and its slow time uh, uh, to seriously question why most everyone engaged in metaverse herds around the same small clusters when the territory is much, much larger and unexplored. So uh, more explorations, more supply surprises, and that's where I'd like to end. Uh, okay, so that was exactly 45 minutes. Um, I, I hope this makes some sense and more importantly, some relevance to um, where the metaverse uh, is today. And again, uh, this idea that mediated presence, uh, at least if you believe Mark Zuckerberg is what's driving him and uh, lots of money going on around it. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I really appreciated all of the references and specifically how they weren't all just using headsets and still talking about this topic about immersion. And I guess I have uh, two questions. The first one being, um, I'm curious about if in your work, you seem, uh, if you've discovered like a, maybe a, an op optimal use cases for like 2D experiences versus 3D more immersive experiences. Um, I, I kind of an example is like, there's a trend right now of taking like historic artists that make like 2D work and making them immersive into like these 3D spaces. And I'm just kind of curious in making these works. Is there something fundamental about their work originally being 2D? And like, is there kind of a dichotomy between the, the benefits of something that is specifically two-dimensional versus three-dimensional? Um, and then uh, second question is, um, in your understanding of mediated presence, I was wondering if, if you see there's an importance to interactivity in your definition of that. And I was wondering if there's like a, is there a threshold or limit um, to like the design of these simulated ex experiences? Like, is there an, an ethical limit of like, maybe it's too real or too many sensations yeah. or are there like physical limits also about like side effects of nausea and, and other things that we think that there's a boundary there that shouldn't be crossed. <laughs> okay, well, those are two good questions. Uh, the first one, um, if you were a living filmmaker like Woody Allen, uh, who occasionally makes black and white movies and somebody were to say, hey, we can colorize it. I don't think he'd you know, go for that. So yes, I wholeheartedly agree that uh, the choice and style of medium is uh, very strongly up to the artist. Um, a coda on that, uh, the little display that we made for Telewindow, uh, everything that we believed in went out the window. We were hell-bent that you needed four cameras uh, to credibly get you know profile views of people. But size matters. When, when we made the display this big, rather than desktop size or larger like uh, Google's doing, um, it really didn't matter. It didn't matter. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, uh, a point well taken. Regarding your second question, that's a huge, huge issue. Um, because remember, there still are storytellers that don't want their stories messed with. You know, Hollywood movies are not interactive for a reason. And I doubt that would ever go away. Uh, I think you're asking more about like thresholdy issues, like can it be too real? Um, and I would direct you to um, Ang Lee's film. Somebody will have to help me with this. It's called Billy Something's Long March. And it's about 10 years old. It only showed in a few cities. And he did frame rate tests um, with uh, stereo cameras between 24, 48, 60, and 120 frames per second. 
And everybody who saw those tests said, you could tell the difference between 60 and 120 frames per second. So here's a film that he shot in 120 frames per second stereo. And um, and he, he's a good filmmaker and Variety magazine in particular tore the film about, apart as being too real. They, they said it was really disturbing. And they, they couldn't really give reasons. Um, and it certainly wasn't because of artifacts, which is, you know, a huge reason. So again, I think we have to explore. And the only kind of thing to kind of answer both questions simultaneously is when it comes to this level of mediation and human perception, um, theory can only get you so far. I, I, so many things that I thought were definitely going to work didn't. And things that I was certain wouldn't work did. So, you know, this is kind of a cry to uh, build stuff, test it yourself. We don't know the answer to your second question. Hmm. And could I, if I may have one follow-up to that, I was curious in, in kind of this dichotomy, what you're saying about how filmmakers don't really, some filmmakers don't want their stories to be messed with. Um, and kind of like the immersion of some of these media, specifically with metaverse and, and such, is there, or have you experienced any like, middle ground between something like uh, a game where everything is kind of interactive and like a story where nothing's interactive like the only thing i can think about is like bandersnatched was the film that came out on netflix a while back that tried to kind of bridge this gap yeah. there was like a strict story but there's some interactivity i'm just wondering if you see any potential in that area or i've seen any other applications of like a bridging of those two things okay so i guess we have time for a little story um if you Google the world's first interactive filmmaker, you will probably get a Czech guy named Radus Chinchera, who did it for uh, the Czech Pavilion at Expo 67 Montreal. And every seat had a red and a green button in front of it. And the screen was surrounded by numbered red, green lights. Uh, for, for seat numbers. So right there, um, it was clear that this wasn't fake. Bandersnatch, I'm, there's no way to tell, but I, I really don't think there's very much interactivity there. So uh, at the end of every scene, a live uh, performer would walk on stage and uh, say, now, which direction do you want to go? Does boy ask girl out or does, um, uh, uh, or does he ask her out or not? vote and then it instantly goes into the next scene and this is film by the way uh and uh the way he did it and, and i met him many years later you can find my my interview with him uh uh was he cleverly and there were 10 scenes so two to the 10th options by the end he cleverly wrote a story that no matter which option you picked it would go back to the same next option. Uh, should boy ask her out, yes or no? If yes, meet at the coffee shop at five. If no, he's bummed and he's wandering by the coffee shop at five and she happens to be there and goes into the next scene. Um, uh, what he told me when we met, he said the whole thing was a joke. Uh, it was kind of a um, commentary on democracy in Czech Republic at the time. Uh, and there's a lot of that going on in so many aspects of gaming uh, where, you know, you don't have as much control as you maybe think you do. So I think there's a huge amount of wiggle room and trickery a la Houdini uh, that can be done in the middle and make some very satisfying experiences. Oh, awesome. Yeah, thank you for your responses. Yeah. Hey, Michael, great to see you again. Fantastic uh, to hey, hear you talk. It was wonderful. Thank you. Um, it, um, a couple of quick comments. The uh, whole idea of presence is being at the core of everything now, I think it's, it's really poignant because, you know, we've thought a lot about, you know, sensors being everywhere and how to tunnel the feeling of presence into all this data that is, is coming from all kinds of locations. 
you can start to really play with this whole idea of what does it mean to be somewhere. It's just an intriguing moment. Yeah. But you know, going further, uh, talking about Lomax and all the archiving and, and the sorting that's been done with the media in the past, it, we're kind of in another pivotal moment there too. I mean, your Woody Allen, your Woody Allen statement is a great one because he made that to be black and white. But look what Peter Jackson did with the black and white footage of World War I, <laughs> colorizing it, correcting it, cleaning up with a computer. My God, you understand how brutal that war was in ways you never could before. Um, so technology can address the detritus of the past and bring us to somewhere totally new with it, especially now with generative AI, right? You have all these recordings, they can all be characterized and segmented with computers at this point very effectively. And then you can start generating works that never existed before by projecting them forward. So we're seeing the beginnings of it. Uh, it's already amazing. At some point we're gonna hit roadblocks, but they're gonna keep you know, getting pushed out. Where do you think this is gonna, gonna go? And could we actually um, well, be present in places that never existed, right? I mean, in yeah. some sense. Uh, well, first of all, your point is is very well taken, and the Peter Jackson work uh, and work like that just sends a chill down my spine. You know, it's kind of amazing. Uh, there's a whole community of people that are colorizing and um, upframing uh, the the first half decade of cinema. You know, New York City streets and whatnot. And, and again, there's something visceral about it. Um, the 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 one flag that I I do feel needs to be like thrown is if you're making you know most people think of the metaverse almost by definition as being uh fiction places that's all fine but um there's a flag when you're dealing with actual places that if you make uh something that looks like a Papua New Guinea village uh through um AI a Papua New Guinean might say, but that isn't an actual one, uh, or it's not mine. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I think we have to be cautious and respectful of um, stuff dealing with the actual world. And by the way, that that kind of brings into the conversation, not just gamers with their fantasy worlds, but ecologists and geographers and anthropologists and First Nations people. Um, and I have people that they're not even in the back row um, at, at, you know, uh, a meta connect uh, conference. It's just not in the room. So that that's where I would draw a line. And, but I, I see it as a positive thing. I think it would be awesome to uh, do the Papua New Guinea village with, with the Papua New Guinean uh, uh, collection of people uh, uh, advising. Great. I think Phil had a Hello. Hey, Hi. Thanks for an amazing talk. Really interested in a lot of that. Um, a question that I had specifically going back to the live telepresence parts that you were working on. Uh, it's a topic that I'm really interested in right now. And one of the things that I'm curious about is kind of these telepresence interactions, like more than just kind of seeing the person kind of in 3D. Have you experimented with other kinds of interactions that maybe let the users control each other's spaces or kind of have like a deeper connection more than just like even 3D video? And if so, any recommendations or things that you've seen that work particularly well to kind of establish that telepresent feel? Uh, absolutely. And the first thing I do is I show my students a uh, tangible media website and, and Hiroshi's work uh, in, in this. It's hands down. Hi, Hiroshi. I hope you're really there. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's just so far beyond. And, you know, part of the beauty of the whole thing in addition to the unpredictability when you begin, is the low bandwidth of a lot of these things. Um, and, you know, we're so visual centric. So we talk about pixels and 3D and uh, dynamic range and, you know, stuff like that. But a little bit of bandwidth can go a long, long way uh, uh, if you know it's live. And, and by the way, I, I don't even know, I, I ask my students, Let's see, I usually use three examples. Uh, could Moses, after he left Canaan for the promised land, possibly imagine what his family was doing at the moment? Uh, could Columbus in the New World possibly think of what Queen Isabella was doing like that? And when Napoleon was in 
Egypt, could he imagine what uh, Josephine was having for breakfast? And maybe the answer is yes, but not in the way that we think about live post telegraph, where when once it's electronic, it, it really is simultaneous. And why, when we believe something is live, it has some resonance is magic. I, I really, it's pretty cool, I think. I don't think it's my No, we're one moving. It's the network. Maybe on there. I think it's there. Is he in the Oh, oh uh, you're back. So you actually just cut out for that last part you were saying. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So, so it, I think we lost you at like saying that the simultaneousness adds some things, but we lost you there. So yeah, well, it does. Uh, th th there's something if you know something's live. Um, if you believe something's live, even if it's not live, it it just adds some something that I again I don't know um, if anyone's really nailed what exactly that is because it's something cognitive, and again, it doesn't even have to be live as long as you think it's live. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Thank you.